Welcome to today's panel discussion. I am ex so excited. Uh, please come right in and join us. Uh, and my name is Sherry Nassim, and I am the CEO of Center for Executive Excellence. And we are thrilled that you are joining us today for this fascinating discussion. Uh, uh, you are among over 185 registrants from around the world uh, for this quarterly panel discussion. And we invite you to come as you are today from wherever you are and to acknowledge and to express gratitude also for the indigenous peoples who cared for this land for a millennia uh, in the present and in the future. Our organization is headquartered in San Diego, California on the traditional lands of the Kumeyaay Nation, translated as the people who overlook the ocean from the cliffs. Perfect. We are committed to continuing to learn the stories of this land and to celebrate its caretakers. If there are any indigenous people with us today, please feel free to share your tribe in the chat so that we may recognize you. We treat these events as community builders, so feel free to use the tool that my colleague Danielle is dropping in the chat to share the lands that you inhabit if you like. Share your LinkedIn profile if you want to do that. Let us know what organization you're with, or if you're between roles, that's just fine too. As you're doing that, I just want to go over a few housekeeping uh, tips to help you have the very best experience possible. So first, we encourage you, if you like, to edit your name and add your pronouns. Just click on the three dots in your Zoom box, and uh, you can change your uh, add your pronouns if you want. Uh, mine are she, her, by the way. Also, you can click on the up arrow next to the closed caption and then show subtitles if you would like to take advantage of that feature today as well. Uh, we reserved about 25 minutes at the end of the panel discussion uh, to take your questions. So please put your questions for the panel, if you have any, in the Q&A box. And then everyone will have the ability to upvote on the questions uh, that they would most like for the panel to address. Uh, our team will be dropping hyperlinks to supplemental information in the chat. And we encourage you to do the same. Uh, to help all of us continue to build awareness. We'll share both the recording of this panel discussion and a transcript from the chat with all of you as soon as we can turn that around. And if you're interested in earning your DEI executive certificate credentials, getting access to our micro learning platform, or signing up for our news about next year's quarterly DEI panel discussion, uh, Danielle, my colleague, will tell you about that at the very end of the session today. Okay. Let's move into the panel discussion. It is my honor to introduce this esteemed group of DEI practitioners who have graciously gathered with us today to share their time and experience with this community. So let's get into it. Arthur Benjamin, our six time DEI panel moderator is an experienced talent acquisition, diversity and inclusion leader with two decades of demonstrated history in strategic thought leadership and planning around the complexities of talent engagement, culture, diversity and inclusion. Arthur's influence and advisory has won him praise and numerous awards from around the world just this year. If I, and I, there may be even some more to add to this, but just this year, he has been the DEI Global Influencer Award winner, the Most Influential African American Leaders in Business Award, the, and the Top 100 DEI Leaders in the Nation by Mogul. Please join me in welcoming back our bestie and yours, Art Benjamin. <laughs> uh, next up is Alfred Lerma, he, him who serves as a senior project manager at Illumina, a global leader in array-based solutions for DNA, RNA, and protein analysis. Alfred serves as a culture leader for San Diego operations, diversity, equity, and inclusion advocate, chair of the employee resource group alumni team, and well-being champion. His gratitude is heightened by working with a company that invests in the health of its employees and the planet. In addition to his professional life, Alfred is the co-founder of Present Moment Living, where he and his spouse serve as meditation teachers and Qigong therapists. Alfred is passionate about leaving a legacy of care and unity for the betterment of present and future generations. Welcome to the panel, Alfred. Cheryl Thompson 
is the founder and CEO of the Center for Automotive Diversity, Inclusion, and Advancement, Cadia. It was launched in 2017 with the idea that diverse talent has long been overlooked and undervalued in the automotive industry. A member-based organization, Cadia provides diversity, equity, and inclusion tools, networks, insights, and practical advice to companies in the automobility space. A veteran of the automotive industry, Cheryl has over 30 years of experience at Ford Motor Company and American Axle in Manufacturing in positions ranging from tool and die, operations, manufacturing engineering, and global leadership. Cheryl has been recognized as a 2019 Influential Women in Manufacturing honoree, a 2019 Corp Magazine Salute to Diversity Award winner, Marketing and Sales Executives of Detroit Platinum Award, and is the recipient of two Diversity and Inclusion Awards from Ford Motor Company. So, so nice to have you with us today, Cheryl. And rounding out our panel today, is Casey Tonnelly, who has established a reputation as an innovative and passionate leader, development coach, anti-racism educator, and diversity, equity, and inclusion strategist. Casey has been delivering attentive and dedicated program management for over 15 years, sustaining and guiding community initiatives, striving to support diverse and underserved populations. At Center for Executive Excellence, we are excited to have Casey as our master lead facilitator for our newly launched DEI Executive Certificate Programs. Thank you so much for joining us, Casey. And with that, it is my pleasure. I am going to leave it to this panel to in your good hands, Art, and I will see you on the other side. Thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, welcome everyone for joining us for this incredible topic around allyship in action. Uh, I want to again add my voice to Sherry to welcome our esteemed panelists, Alfred, Casey, and Cheryl. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so looking forward uh, to having this conversation with you. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for setting time aside uh, to be a part of this discussion with us as we talk about the importance of allyship. Uh, everyone, are you ready to get in? We're ready to get into the topic. Let's jump in. All right. Um, our first question um, to the panelists uh, is, let's start with agreeing on a working definition of what allyship in action actually is. Uh, and where does allyship fit on the continuum from a thoughts and prayers to being willing to put yourself on the line for someone else? And I feel like that's a two part question. So the first part is, let's start with agreeing on a working definition of what allyship in action is. And then that second part of that question is, uh, how do we move from this continuum of, you know, we're sending thoughts and prayers to, hey, I'm willing to really have some personal risk in this of allying for someone else. I wanna um, pitch that first question to Alfred and then we'll open it up to Casey and Cheryl. Alfred, can you start us off? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, let me first say it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, so many great people with so much amazing experience. Um, I'm very humbled to be here. Uh, and, I, and I'm grateful for everyone taking the time out of your day to show up. And you know, that's a, one of the first steps of allyship here, right, is, is having the intention to show up and to learn. And you took your valuable time to be here with us. I'm very appreciative of that. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, the land acknowledgement starting off the session, you know, as myself being a Native American um, in Chiricahua Apache, uh, that you know I very much appreciate that acknowledgement there opening up the session. So thank you for that. Uh, you know, for myself, I I think what I've come to realize in my own personal philosophy and practice um, is that I, I'm seeing allyship in three different levels proactive allyship, active allyship, and reactive allyship. And before we can get to active allyship, we, everyone always says, hey, it's gotta be intentional. You can't, just, you can't just hope you get better because we already know that the patterns and programs that are running within us uh, are running deep within our subconscious and those habitual response patterns continue to show up day in and day out. And unless we have an intentional practice and carve out that space and time, within our day to think about how we could be a better ally, 
um, chances are we won't just get there with hope. We got to have that intentional uh, effort there. Um, and so it, the other big thing for me is that it's, it's also about imagining your allyship. So any athlete, any performer, anyone who's, you know, going out on stage and what they do, they work internally to imagine how they're going to show up. And so, you know, before we get to start with the act of allyship, I think it's really important that we take the time to imagine ourselves showing up in a way where we can express our care, that allyship care, um, and know that we're not going to be perfect. And so we got to be able to have some self-compassion with ourselves as we, you know, look to show up. Uh, but it's, it's, to me, it's really about, let's, let's start first with intention and imagination. Visualize yourself having the emotional intelligence and the language to be able to be there and be present for the moment to know, do I need to listen? Do I need to be vocal? Do I show support in a group? Do I show it afterwards? Um, and that practice of presence uh, is something that we cultivate over time. Uh, but I really want to highlight that part of intention and imagination uh, as a key, key ingredients to that allyship recipe. Um, and so, you know, I'd be happy to, to, to pass that back over to you, Art, or anyone else who wants to expand from there. Well, I, I loved, Alfred, what you were saying about the intentionality of allyship. Um, and, you know, I think about allyship um, in terms of it's important when there's a power differential. Um, if I have an advantage over someone for whatever reason, you know, maybe it's more social capital, um, maybe it is more positional power. Um, I that's where I think allyship can be so so helpful. Um, so I, that's the only thing I would add to your beautiful definition. You know, where, the, where there's a power differential. I love that, Cheryl and Alfred. I love the intentionality, Alfred. You mentioned imagination, seeing your allyship. Um, you also mentioned the emotional intelligence um, component of that. Uh, I, I just, I loved all that. And then Cheryl, you adding that power differential, um, really showing that, that you do have an advantage. You have something uh, to bring to the table that allows someone else to benefit from your positioning, whatever that may look like. Um, I love that. Uh, Casey, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, do I? Uh, I? First of all, I loved, I always love listening to how people talk about particular topics because the nuance of language uh, is always so fascinating and getting to listen to you both. I was like, oh, that's a good piece too. Okay, I got to include that too. Um, and I always love that. I think one of the things that I think about is uh, I struggle with allyship. I struggle with allyship because I think frequently people um, give it to themselves. <laughs> they give themselves that kind of uh, badge of honor. And, and, and that's not always true for like how people are experiencing you. So I, I think a lot about when I think about allyship, um, I do think there is that spectrum, right? Like to me, thoughts and prayers is apathetic. Uh, that really doesn't mean much. Right. Uh, you're not even leaning into an awareness piece or to be conscious of it. Like that feels super apathetic to me. Um, but then leaning into like, well, what does it look like when people are like, I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah, right. Let's 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 expand on that awareness. Let's start building that learning and deepening that lens. Um, and then going into more like once you move past awareness, like are you leaning into a level of um, uh, activism? You know, starting to name those things that you're saying. Are you starting to like interrupt those comments at the dinner table? Um, are you uh, then moving into advocacy to being like, hey, actually, here's a policy that I know causes harm. How do we fix it? Right. And so that I always think that there is that progression, but also at the same time, there's so many dimensions of diversity. Uh, my understanding around whiteness, around race, and racism is much deeper than my understanding of neurodiversity. Uh, and so I think that there's this piece too of like, in some ways, some folks, if they're in relationship with me, might experience me as an ally. And others are like, really? 
uh, like my learning is continuing there, right? Like I'm still in the awareness phase when it's like exploring different dimensions of diversity. And so I always think that there's like a level of a dance that goes into it of like, sometimes you lead, sometimes you follow, uh, sometimes you trip, uh, sometimes it's like, ooh, round of applause, right? And so like, I always think that there's that piece around um, recognizing that allyship is complex, evolving, expansive, deepening, almost never looks the same way. Um, and, you know, and I just think that that, like to that, to the point earlier about like bringing in curiosity, where are you practicing that cultural humility? Where, where does that like part, like being like, hey, you're a human being, uh -huh. I care about you. So I wanna make sure that you have what you need so you can thrive in the way that you choose, uh, right? And like to me, like when I think about it, I just always think of like, it's just so much more new ones uh, than any anyway. Oh my gosh, I just have to say, I love the dance analogy. Sometimes you trip and sometimes you fall down, right? And I think people get so nervous um, about speaking up and being an ally because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing, put their foot in their mouth. And I do it, you know, all the time. And thankfully people let me know <laughs> when I've made a mistake, but you know, it does hit me a little bit sometimes in the heart, like, oh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I get a little bit nervous about speaking up. So, you know, to Alfred's point about using our emotions intelligence and putting fear to the side um so important i think allyship anxiety is a real thing oh, <laughs> and yes. you know there's so many times that <laughs> you get that anxiousness because you want to be a good person you want to do something good but you just don't know how it's going to land and when you're just not grounded and you know you're responding out of a out of a habit or a program or a pattern and you know, the word, how you thought the words were going to come out and then how they actually come out. Uh, and then, you know, having to, you know, go back and reflect on that and how to improve it. But, you know, I think just with, with Casey was saying about the continuous learning aspect of this is that, you know, I'm, I'm I, you know, to me, I just, I feel like everyone needs an ally. You know, we're at 7.98 billion people. We might get to 8 billion before the year's end. To me, that's 8 billion people that need an ally but the allyship is unique to the individual based upon their belief, their perceptions, their uh, intersectionality, like what makes them um, who they are. And, and to me, allyship is care. And so how do we show care for that individual? And, and the only way to really know that is through conversation that says, you know, I, I know that some people might be a part of a larger community and that community has needs, but the person within the community has individual needs. and so. If, if you don't know those specific needs, then it's assumed allyship. And so you only know it through the connection and through the conversation that says, let me hear your story. Let me get to know you and let me understand what that allyship recipe, that care looks like for you as a person. That's why by no means am I an allyship expert. I'm an allyship practitioner and I will always be a practitioner as long as I have breath. I, I am all over the place. First of all, allyship anxiety I, I i we could have shut down the zoom and been done with this by once we got that absolutely amazing all of you absolutely incredible i do want to lean in on something casey said casey if you would uh unpack and then the other panelists can add to this as well uh you spoke a little bit about allyship and how allyship comes across as a badge of honor that we wear and and it's not always um, looked at from the end of the, the individual or community that is needing the ally. And so how important it is, and again, this is to Casey, but to all of our panelists, how important it is that allyship or our, um, our identif identification as an ally come more so from that community look saying that, hey, I see you as an ally and less from us saying, oh, I'm an ally, I'm an ally, and yet, we have no clue what allying for that community looks like. Uh, Casey and then the panelists would love to unpack that. I wanna be honest on this. I wanna be real in our discussion. Uh, this is why we're here. So let's have some really meaningful conversation around this. Uh, so on board for that art. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times about like, my career started, especially in the DEI realm, doing anti-racism work in the Seattle Police Department. Um, and I was like learning things 
saying things, but very little of that was super embodied. Like it wasn't actually embodied yet. And, and then the other piece to that was I am in, I have the gift of being in like very deep, intimate relationship with a number of other um, practitioners who do this work across racial lines. And I know the, the folks who I'm their go-to, right? Like they pick up the phone, they call me when they're having a bad day. Uh, I'm the person they want to pull them in for a project. But I also know the second I leave my front door, there are a lot of people who have no idea who I am. And there's potentially, I'm a greater threat than an asset to them, right? They might be worrying if I'm going to call the cops. They might be worrying if I'm going to like start a rumor about, you know, whatever it might be. And so I think that like the awareness of that always has to be that um, until I can demonstrate how I am a safer person for folks, um, I can't claim to be their ally. Um, you know, and I think that there are these pieces of like, I want to operate principally, which means like just because I'm not in a DEI conversation doesn't mean I'm not going to talk up when I'm like, hey, that person was talking. Can we let them listen to their sentence? I'd love to hear it. Still going to do that. Uh, but I think that there's that piece around, it's not a title I wear. Um, I try to operate within anti-racism principles and like DEI principles that hopefully because of my behavior and my engagement and the words I choose and who I choose to say them to help to demonstrate um, that I might be a person that somebody can build relationship with or um, maybe trust. Uh, but that's why I always think like, for me, I'm always like, how do I operate in solidarity? Um, because I actually have to demonstrate that. And, um, and delightfully, people call me out all the time when I'm not operating that way. And so I think that it's really helpful <laughs> to kind of have that as a practice of like, are, where, are my behaviors, my mindsets, and my actions matching the language that is coming out of my mouth? That's huge, Casey. I absolutely love that. And I think um, in the context of, of workplace, I think it is important that we do take inventory and consider, you know, before I wear a allyship badge and say, oh, I went to a training to be an ally and now I'm an ally is really making sure that, you know, our actions are really is what is speaking that we truly are working towards allyship or we're desiring to be an ally or we're hoping to be an ally to align with people and speak up and have that personal risk factor. I think that's sometimes what we forget is that personal risk factor. Um, or using our opportunities to really speak up for individuals and communities that may not otherwise have an opportunity. Um, Cheryl, I think you wanted to share something. I was just going to say, you know, two of my favorite quotes are uh, allyship is a verb, not a noun. And you're not an ally unless somebody calls you an ally. You can't name that your, to yourself, right? <laughs> That is so good. I, I absolutely agree with that. I think if, if you're walking around calling yourself an ally and nobody else is echoing that, you probably should reconsider whether you're an ally. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let's go to question number two for our panelists. Um, who has agency to be an ally and how do you know when it's right to exercise that agency? I'll ask the question again. Who has agency to be an ally? And how do you know when it's right to exercise that agency? We're going to start this question with Cheryl, and then we'll open it up to the other panelists. Yeah, I think back to that power differential. You know, anyone that has power, influence, or social capital, political capital, however you want to call it, and they see an inequity, I think it's their responsibility to be an ally, to, to stand up and be an ally, especially if there's, you know, something that's systemic. You know, I think it's upon them to sit back and self-reflect on how they may be able to help, right? And as we were talking, it's so situational. So it could be me declining a speaking opportunity if there's a, if everyone on the panel is white or the you know the, the whole conference is just white. You know, I've had that happen to me before. I was on a panel 
all white women. And we were having like this little DEI conversation afterwards. And someone brought that up and I'm like, oh, like, how did I not see that? Right. I should have declined the opportunity and introduced them to someone else. Right. For, that had, um, you know, some element of diversity. Right. Um, it could also be um, asking someone to turn on the subtitles. If you know someone in the participant list is, you know, English is their second language. Um, I, the best thing I heard of allyship, it was a woman who has a hearing impairment and she got really tired all the time saying, can you please speak up? And her boss in a meeting knew she had this hearing impairment and someone was talking low and he actually said, hey, can you please speak up so we can all hear you, right? He took that burden off of her, which I thought was amazing. Um, but I really think we need to, especially those who are in those positions of power and influence to really look for those systemic inequities, right? It could be something like the interview process. Um, do we have questions that every single interview panel is using that are the same. It could be making sure we've got diversity on the candidate slate, of course, qualified diversity candidates on that slate. Um, it could be, um, oh my gosh, I, I just think it's like leading from behind, right? Um, and as someone was saying, sometimes we're leading from the front, sometimes it's from the side. I think allyship, <clears throat> excuse me, really requires us to listen, to watch what's going on, and to really be leading from behind. And then the last thing I'll add is you should have some alignment. Um, some people get offended if you jump in and try to, you know, uh, be that ally. You know, um, there's that term white savior, <laughs> right? So I think you also have to be careful that you don't make it all about you um, and that you really kind of hang back and see what's needed. Um, I had a, a situation with a boss of mine. Um, this is when I was in manufacturing, right? Very white male dominated. And we were working with um, some suppliers and the suppliers, all white male, kept looking at him, although I was the one responsible for the project. And he could have just, you know, stood up and said, hey, you need to talk to Cheryl. But he did something without words that was really powerful. He got up and he said, um, I have something to attend to. And he just walked away and let me lead the rest of the meeting, right? So allyship looks different and it's just very situational. And we have to be a little bit careful about does that person really need my allyship? How, how do I make sure I'm giving them voice? So. I love that. I absolutely love that. Really making sure that our allyship is truly allyship. Um, and making sure that we're doing it for the benefit of that individual or community and not necessarily, as you said, for ourselves to kind of bring some, as Casey said earlier, badge of honor to ourselves. That's, that's great, Cheryl. Anyone else? Sure, yeah, I, I just, I, I love what you're sharing there as, as, as well, because I think at times, if we come in and be like, okay, where can I be an ally right now? And we're constantly trying to look to, to, to show up and then an opportunity presents itself. And then we're like, oh, here's my moment to show my allyship. Um, you know, we could get lost in even in the intention to, you know, overstep in, in being an ally. And, you know, you know, not everyone really needs our support. Some people are working on, you know, their own courage in, in certain situations. And just being able to give the space for them to practice that because we could then take that courage opportunity away and that personal practice to be able to then say, well, how, how am I going to kind of, you know, ally for myself, you know, some self allyship. Um, so we definitely, it's important to be mindful of that. And, you know, I was just thinking about just earlier when we were, you know, talking about, you know, as, as we learn and we get this allyship knowledge it's that practice in these times that moves us from allyship knowledge to allyship intelligence um and and that's where that's that applied knowledge um and so i just think that within these different situations uh and these unique moments that we have and practicing you know being supportive people uh that we do need to be aware of the environment and aware of what's right uh for that and so we're not 
overstepping that and and taking away from something that is really meant for someone else. And maybe someone else needs to be an ally in that moment as well. And so, you know, can you see if maybe there's an opportunity for someone else to step in and express their allyship? Um, but I think it's nice that if we could be around a group of people, we're actually vocalizing our intention collectively to be allies and at least the practice of it without the being labeled as such, um, then it becomes more of an open practice within everyone. So as it occurs, there's learning that's happening uh, because we're aware of it and we're looking to do it together. And so even more that we could be uh, intentional as a collective group or a collective team, uh, then it becomes easier to practice that in the moment with a supportive group. Um, so yeah, thank you for that share show. Art, do you mind if I add something? Okay. Uh, you know, I have a confession. I was a good white person. And when I say good, I mean good, right? Like I was a good white person. I wanted to be seen, right? Like I wanted to be seen and like shore up and like acknowledging injustice. Uh, and that was an earlier moment of my journey. Right. So I also think that like there's this acknowledgement that uh, I don't think anybody was like, you know what? I woke up one day and I was like, that's it. I got allyship down. I know how to do it. I know how to do it for everybody. It's going to feel great. Uh, that doesn't happen. Right. And so I think that like I share that as a point of being like I have had my own journey with this and it's still going on. Right. Because like as I have the gift of getting to age, um, I get to turn around and be like, hey, what? What are these generations saying? Wait, say that again, right? Like, I got some learning to do. I got some listening to do. And that happens in so many different directions. So that there's this piece of like, I always want to invite folks, if it's not passing the SNP test, right? Like, interrupt it. If you mess up, own it learn from it, right? Because I think that there's this piece too of like, this is how we evolve and keep growing in the work as well, is that we make mistakes. And then how do we acknowledge them? How do we make an amends for that? How do we learn from that without like being like, now educate me on how I might've harmed you and what I could do differently, right? Like that's ours, but like we can always, like we're gonna make mistakes but like, are we open to the learning? Are we opening to the growth? Are we opening to like actually having meaningful accountability where we're like, I'm so sorry, that was terrible. Here's what I'm gonna do different. And I also wanna say thank you for like taking the emotional labor to like invest in me doing better. Here's how I plan on being accountable. Uh, would you like me to keep you updated on that? Right? Like. That's real different, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I didn't start that way, right? And so I think that like there's this piece of like acknowledging that like all of us are learning and growing. All of us are trying to do better, at least in this space, right? All of us in this space are trying to do better. And that like, uh, Alfred, to your point of that self-compassion, that self-forgiveness of like, um, sometimes we're gonna try things and it's not gonna go the way we hoped. Uh, the our impact isn't going to match our intent. So then, what do we do? Then we because that matters, right? Uh, I have been invested in by many, many wonderful people, and I look back and I'm like, oh God, how did they stay with me during that time? Uh, right? And so I think that there's this piece of like, how do we offer ourselves the same gifts and forgiveness and compassion that we're willing to give others? who are also willing to learn. I think one of the things in this space that oftentimes gets overlooked as Casey and all of us know as DNI leaders is that again, it's this, this vulnerability to make mistakes. And you know, I've been in DNI organizations, I've been in organizations where I've led diversity and inclusion, and they want you to roll out a program. They're like, hey, look, train me how to do allyship so I don't make any more mistakes. And I'm like, there's no such there's no such training. It's like every training will make you better at being aware, self-aware. You know, it'll make you better at engaging so that hopefully you're listening better. But this, this doesn't mitigate mistakes. Uh, oftentimes mistakes are your best teacher. 
when it comes to allyship in this space. And so it is interesting, again, this vulnerability to be able to recognize that mistakes are going to happen, recognize that we're all learners and, and we're constantly learning in this space of allyship. And hopefully as we learn, our allyship gets better, gets stronger. And uh, that's huge. And But I've yeah, been a part of organizations that are like, teach me how to do allyship so I don't have to worry about making mistakes in meetings anymore. And I'm like, there's no such training that exists. I don't think you can be a good ally unless you've made mistakes, right? Unless you've put your foot in your mouth. You know, the, I used to be a tool and die maker before I got into engineering. And I was operating a milling machine one time and I was pushing the speeds in the feeds and all of a sudden my cutter broke. Boom, right? Went flying across the shop floor. I'm devastated. And the uh, uh, a mature journeyman came over and said to me, don't worry, kid, if you're not pushing hard enough, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying hard enough, right? And so I really think that that is part of the journey. It's making those mistakes. I mean, what is a better teacher? I can remember leading a focus group one time and it was the it was um, with a group of Black or African-American people and they were sharing some things that I experienced as a woman. And I was like, oh my gosh, me too. That And I was, and I like look back on that now and I went and apologized to the gentlemen that were in the group, right? I made it about me. <laughs> it wasn't about me, it was about them, but I'll never make that mistake again, right? It's just part of our journey. <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. And I'm seeing some great comments in the chat. Thank you so much everyone uh, for just hanging out with us and having this conversation. Before we go to the next question, do, do anyone, Alfred, are you wanting to add to that? Go ahead. Yeah, there's so much great stuff coming through here. So I was just, you know, touching a couple of things here. Um, one, one of the principles that we have in operations is um, right the first time. Um, but there are times where you don't get it right the first time. Uh, but just remembering that each new moment is a new moment to get it right. The first time uh and so it's, it's 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 just being able to then learn from those experiences and then to pass that knowledge that wisdom to the next person so they're not making the same mistakes that you made granted maybe it's a little bit different for for them um but our ability to share our experiences similar to what's happening now is so important for us to be able to then pass down this is how I failed. Uh, this is how I learned from that failure. Let me share this with you so you don't fall into the same pit hole that I fell into because I was naive or ignorant at the time. And granted, still are on many things. But let me just try to share some of this um, wisdom that has come over time from our experiences and helped us become more mature as, as, as people. You know, I didn't really know DEI work until I got into Illumina and um, I just realized that, oh, I'm just naturally passionate about unification and being good people or being kind and being compassionate. And so being able to go through trainings and programs like these actually helped me put some language and understanding behind the experiences that people were having. Um, but there's one other piece that I want to touch on, which was what I was saying earlier about reactive allyship. So this is after you've done it. Now we're talking about the opportunities and owning the impact that you're like, okay, I did this. We know it wasn't the intention. I want to be a good person, but the way that landed with someone, it did not land good. I was stressed, rushing too much, and I just bypassed someone. And now they have to come back and say, hey, I didn't really feel that you gave me the time of day to share my piece or make me feel valued as a person and in these experiences, whether it's through allyship or just kind of failures that we have in life, that being that we're so heavily programmed in a self-critical mindset and, a, and an expectation of perfection of self, that unless there's a self-compassion practice, when we fall, we fall hard because there's nothing to fall into. There's no self-love net. There's no self-compassion. When it's good, it's great. We don't necessarily need that self-care, that self-love net. But in these times of reflection, and we've had an experience, and as we think, whether we are just daydreaming, meditating, or we get information from someone, and we realize, how could I have done this differently? If I could show up again, how would I show up? And as we think about the woulda, coulda, shouldas, 
and then we get the answer like oh my god of course then instead of repeating the cycle of replaying oh my god i failed i failed and we're just we got the lesson in that moment at that point is where i step into gratitude thank you for the wisdom that tells me how to take my next step next time as opposed to repeating what i should have done so much so that I can't absorb the lesson and then I show up again and I make the same mistake again. Um, and so it's being able to integrate that new information and that wisdom so with that we could take a better step next time with gratitude for what we've learned with the self-compassion and not overly beating ourselves up because we landed on our face and didn't intend to. Um, so a few thoughts there. Alfred, absolutely love that. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move to our third question. Uh, what are some of the do's and don'ts of putting allyship into action? Again, the question is, what are some do's? What are some of the do's and don'ts uh, of putting allyship into action? We'll start with Casey, and then we'll open it up to the other panelists. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is such a rich conversation and the chat is also blowing up with great questions. So I also hope we can end up getting there as well. Uh, you know, but just some of this has already been mentioned, but, you know, don't center yourself, uh, either in your apology or the experience. Um, do listen to minoritized people, right? Uh, whatever their dimension of diversity might be, they their lived experience is theirs. They don't need to prove that to anybody. Uh, you don't get to question that. Uh, so like when people tell you about their experience, their journey, their story, believe them. Uh, understand that no demographic of diversity is a monolith. Uh, you can't be like, well, all queer people, we're rainbows. Uh, I, for one, can tell you, not all do. Uh, and you know, but like, you have to understand that like not all groups are monoliths. Uh, we have to center intersectionality. Um, I think so much about like with the identities that I carry. And I think about like my community where I'm like black trans women are murdered at an exorbitant rate. They don't get attention. And when they do, they often get uh, disrespected heavily by like using their dead names, not acknowledging the full story of who they were. Um, and so that's who I center in my work, right? Like I'm very clear on that, like in ways that I might be oppressed, I also have privileges. And there are members of my community who for a very long time uh, have been ignored, whitewashed, uh, you know, kind of erased that that's who I want to center. That's who I want to center in this work is like the intersectionality work, um, that it's going to be lifelong learning. We're always learning because the work also changes, terms also evolve. Uh, I don't know about any of y'all, but during COVID when I was like binge watching show after show where I was like, oh my God, they said that on TV, right? Like where I'm like, yeah, buddy, that was eight years ago. <laughs> it was not that long ago. Uh, and so like recognizing that language, the work it evolves. And so like, we have to be open for that evolving taking risks, make mistakes. I mean, when it comes to risk, people are like, well, I don't want to offend anybody. Is that really true? Do you really not want to offend anybody or do you want to not want to feel embarrassed? Because that's different, right? And so uh, I always think about those things of like, what are the risks? Like, like start, I, I try to practice curiosity when people are, are fear resistant, um, building relationships across dimensions of diversity. One of my favorite things is that on paper, some of my closest people, you would never think we were chosen family, but we are, right? And so I think that there's something about building those deep, meaningful, connective, intimate relationships across difference, not just helps us in our own journey of allyship, but also in our own steadfastness in like advocacy work right, in transformation work, um, you know, and as it was mentioned earlier, like, don't call yourself an ally <laughs> if you don't have any connections, uh, or if you have one, right, I'm, I mean, like, I'm hoping gone are the decades where it was like, oh, I have a Black friend, oh, I know a gay person, 
uh, oh, my friend has a kid that has disabilities. Well, that doesn't mean you're an accessibility expert, right? Um, and so like recognizing that our proximity to those different dimensions of diversity is also an indicator of how much learning and growth we have to do in those areas. Um, and so I think that there is that piece of where can you be vulnerable, honest, like it, nobody knows everything. Nobody, I don't care how people behave, nobody knows everything. And so the idea that like something might be new, there's a new awareness, there's a lack of understanding, uh, that's gonna happen. So where, where do you lean into that, right? Like uh, one of my co-conspirators often says, uh, where the discomfort is, is where the growth opportunity is. Uh, and I love that because I, I use that for myself of when I'm like, oh, why does that feel sticky? Why, why? Oh, that might be about me. Oh, that might be about me. Okay, I need to do some work there. Um, and I also would say that the final do that I want to say is this is one of the most overlooked actions. And I'm sure everybody on this call is like, oh, true. Uh, reflection, right? When people are like, just tell me what to do. And I'm like, great. Let's, I have some questions I can send you, you can reflect on. And they're like, oh, I just don't need to know what to do. It's like you want to, like people want to jump to the middle of the journey or to the end of the journey. And that first part's really foundational. And so like where we can include more reflection of ourselves, of our limits, of our lenses, uh, I think the stronger it is for us to be able to build relationships across those differences too. That's so, yeah. that's so profound, Casey. Uh, Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add a, a do and a don't. <laughs> um, so I think a don't is like trying to fix people, right? You're trying to be an ally, but you put yourself up on this pedestal and you think you know better and you're going to tell someone what they should do, right? So I think that's a big no-no. Um, one of the biggest do's um, was a piece of advice I got from a chief diversity officer in the, in the auto industry, a Black woman, and she said, we don't necessarily need you to speak up for us when we're in the room. We need you to speak up for us when we're not in the room. Call out that inappropriate joke, right? When something's not right, speak up, right? So it's like be an ally when no one's looking. <laughs> Those would be my do and my don't. I love that. Speak up when, we, when we're not present to speak up for mm -hmm. ourselves. That mm -hmm. shows your true allyship and advocacy. And I'm gonna come back because I've heard Casey mention advocacy uh, a few times and I wanna lean in on what does advocacy look like in your allyship and, and why that is important, especially in today's uh, time of doing d &I before we end. Uh, Alfred, do you have anything to add? Um, it, it actually wasn't specific to that question. I, I did wanna highlight just the, the do's and the don't part. Uh, yeah. If you don't mind, yeah. um, that that I just I want to make sure that it's really important that I feel that we don't lose respect, um, and that respect is so important as a part of you know DEI work and the respect to Casey's point of the story that people tell us that to receive their story with respect um, and to believe in them and what they say, even if we're on another side of the belief spectrum, to you know, not acknowledge them for their story, we need to be able to receive them regardless of where we're at on the spectrum. And even in most cases in a professional setting, if we're going to stand up for someone or call someone out, we need to still be respectful for to the person that we're calling out. Um, because when we start leaning towards accusations, people get really defensive and it doesn't allow for the recipient to learn or to be able to then see, okay, how can I take in this information? And just obviously is assuming the best intention that someone wants to learn. Granted, there's more extreme situations where people you know, might not be the most open or um, maybe have some malicious, malicious intent, but really being respectful to people in that way, I think allows us to have these bridges for learning and so that we can connect together. I mean, I feel that we all have a fire and we all have a passion and it's how we use our individual fires to bring warmth to people, to bring light to situations so we get clarity, but also fire is for transformation. So how do we use our personal fire for the transformation for what we wanna see? 
and we're not tending our fire and we're really you know ag aggressive at times within the use of our fire we can also cause harm and burn with our words and with our presence and our attitude and so i think it's important to use your personal fire and passion in a good way to bring light warmth and transformation i love that absolutely alfred oh my gosh uh, the chat is blowing up. We got people quoting Aretha Franklin in the chat. It's like, go ahead, respect. I love it. Um, absolutely amazing. Uh, Casey, do you have anything in that to add to what I asked about the advocacy piece? When I think like advocacy, like is different than like allyship in my mind, right? Because I think that advocacy is like your analysis has deepened enough that like you're able to look at a budgeting decision, look at a programming decision, and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm noticing that this is cutting out 50% of our admin workforce. Well, women of color make up 80% of that demographic in our workforce. Have we done a racial equity analysis about this decision-making? That's advocacy, yes. right? And I'm not actually being like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take this to the DEI director and being like, hey, you deal with this, um, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to be like, I have enough of an analysis that I can like pretty, pretty calmly uh, mostly bring up that like there could be maybe an unintended consequence, but definitely a racialized consequence or a consequence that actually affects a particular demographic of our workforce that is already mi minoritized in society. Uh, so maybe we revisit that, right? So to me, like that is like a form of advocacy in the work workforce. Um, I think that there's all also this piece around not, I mean, I am at a place in my, my life and career where I'm like, not everybody gets my uh, emotional labor to support their journey, right? Like, I also have to think about who, like, am I taking on an action that is alleviating a stress or a pressure from one of my collaborators of color, from one of my uh, co-conspirators who, like, maybe has less privilege in that scenario, because I think that one of the things that I always think is for me, part of the focus is like who, like what intersectional identities, but who's getting harmed in this moment, right? Um, and like, I will say for many, many years, uh, I definitely was centering white learning. Uh, and that was coming at the cost of like colleagues and employees of color. Um, that's a problem, right? And so like I had to shift. And so I think that there's, there's that piece of how do we create spaces for learning and growth for people maybe who have more privilege and more power, whether that be institutionally or societally, both, um, as well as creating space where we're uh, amplifying, lifting up, uh, operating in solidarity, where folks are feeling uh, the impacts of that labor. I, uh, I mean, Casey, you just, as I knew you would, you just gave a whole lot of incredible nuggets um, around advocacy and and the role of advocacy in in allyship and in our DNI efforts uh, across organizations. And that leads us into our last question for the panelists before we get into questions from the attendees. Our last and final question, which is open to all of our panelists, uh, says, why is allyship necessary to forwarding the work of DEI? Why is allyship necessary uh, to forwarding the work of DEI uh, in our corporate settings? That's open to any of our panelists. Well, I think about underrepresented talent. Um, I think that um, someone has to be an ally, a sponsor, even an advocate for underrepresented talent because oftentimes, there's a lot of self-doubt. If you don't see anyone who looks like you in the leadership pipeline, you just may think there's no spot for me or I don't want to have to change who I am um, to, to lead like that. And so it takes someone really um, seeing the value that that person brings, spending some time with them and really advocating and, and being an ally for them. 
um, whether it's in talent reviews, talent discussions. Um, I think that's really important. I had someone do that for me and it just completely changed my, my whole life, my whole world. But I also think it's really important to have people in the majority act as an ally for DEI practitioners. I can say something and a white male can say the same thing, but people think, oh my God, <laughs> that was just brilliant, right? And I'm just like, huh, like what am I, chopped liver? But I realized now to you know bring them in. I mean, first of all, I think that we we need to widen the circle when we're talking about DE and I. And we talked today about how there's intersectionality. We don't all fit in one box, and many of these diversity dimensions are hidden, right? And so this I saw in the Q and A, right? This topic can be pretty polarizing at times, and I think it's because we all want to matter. We all want to belong, and some people feel like they don't belong and they don't matter. And sometimes it's because they have a disadvantage that we can't see that's holding them back. So that's the other important thing about allyship. You, you, you may not know who needs your allyship, so be aware of that. But I, if I could have my one wish, it would be to see more white males with power and influence um, stand up and be allies on this whole topic of DE&I. I absolutely love that. And I absolutely agree with that. Uh, Alfred, you have something to share? Yeah, the the belonging aspect of it. I think when you know when you're together as a group, the power of unity, the power of belonging in an organization, when you are able to show up knowing that people support you and care about you and want you to be you and bring that of what you bring as your specialty as a person. Um, I know that as a vote of confidence for me when when people said no be you, actually lean more into you, you know, find out your strengths and dive deep into that. And so, you know, I'm over here trying to make my lowest strengths, my, my weaknesses, my highest strengths. And that's a lot of effort and energy of which wasn't coming natural for me. And when people said, no, we want you to be you. And I had that sponsorship. Oh my God, it, it feels so good. You feel seen, you feel supported. And to think if everyone felt that way, and then we all had a shared human experience that was um, being like, okay, we're all suffering in our own way. And we could be seen that, you know, at different times we're up and we're down and we're supported and we lift each other up and we're doing it together and moving in the same direction. Um, the, the rate at which we get to these results are so much, ex they're exponentially faster because of our ability to work together and walk together one step at a time and being a better person. And when we can have allyship through and through, um, I think people feel like they belong and, and, and that allows us to, to, to show up better as a collective team. Uh, now it's the power of numbers. I love that. Um, Casey, you have anything to add? And then I'll jump in and add something. Um, there's power in allyship and solidarity. Right. I mean, how many folks have like gotten hired someone you're like scanning anybody like me, anybody like me? And you're like, oh, no, uh, maybe one, maybe two. Right. And that like, I think that there's this piece of like, we're always scanning. But when we can operate in solidarity and allyship with each other, right, that like, let's just say art's the boss. Uh, and I'm like, hey, art not really feeling really valued here. And he's like, oh, you are. You're very valued. We value you a lot. Okay. Uh, but then I'm like, Cheryl, do you feel valued here? And you're like, no, white men interrupt me every single time I say a sentence. Uh, Alfred, are you feeling welcomed here? And you're like, ah, uh, you know, I have a bad experience. It's right. But like, so that welcomes the thing. And so then if the three of us go to art, right? And we're like, hey, we're all new, not really feeling super welcomed in the onboarding process. There's power. Art is going to be far more receptive to kind of being like, oh, dang, uh, what's going on? Uh, right? And so I think that there's this piece of like, when we get to operate across our differences for the purposes of liberation and justice, uh, we raise all the boats. You know, like we raise them all 
And so I think that the other piece is that um, when there is like this like divisiveness that's both like created and real around like the differences of different demographics of diversity, people in power don't have to do anything, right? And so I think that one of the things that I love about allyship and solidarity is there's power behind it. Um, there's a reason why if one person goes and walk, walks down the street, people are like, what are they doing? But when 5,000 are walking down the street, you're like, oh, this is serious. This is serious, right? And so I think that they're, they're like to never forget that also collective power across differences um, is power um, and, and helps to make change. Amazing, Casey. And I'll just add that um, I, I genuinely believe that allyship is the road to activation for all. I don't think you have to be a practitioner or, or it's not a requirement to be a practitioner of DNI to be an ally. It gets everyone who's on the sidelines into the game. Anyone, everyone has an opportunity to be an ally. And I think that's huge. And I, and I, I know a lot of times we say things like, um, a individual is, um, you know, the individual like the white male who may be, um, they're benefiting from the disposition of, you know, a certain group of women or whatever the case may be. But I really think it, it also empowers uh, me as an African-American male to advocate for Alfred. You know what I mean? And so it allows me to advocate, it allows a female to advocate for another female or to ally for another female. It, it'll, it creates an, an open door for all of us to be a part of the work. And I think that is what allows the work to truly move forward and to have an impact. And with that, I will turn it over to our amazing CEO and host, Sherry who will be taking us further into this discussion. Oh my goodness. Well, first of all, wow, I just feel I feel so empowered. I really do. You you uh, you all hit on so many beautiful uh you know practical tactical, you know, things that we can do, but also esoteric. The reflection I think was was really critically important. Um I you reminded me of uh hearing someone say recently that wisdom comes from experience, but experience comes from making mistakes. So there's no fast track, you know, to being able to just have to practice it and say, I think Casey did a really beautiful job of, oh, I made a mistake, you know, let me make up for that. Should I, should I, you know, check in with you to see if I'm doing better? I, I really appreciated that. So vulnerable, so vulnerable. Gosh, thank you so much. I'm just whew, always so blown away when we do these uh, panel, uh, panel discussions. So I am going to jump into the QA because that's my job not to reflect on my own experience. Okay, so uh, the number one voted uh, question in the Q&A box, and, and this is a very valid question. We asked this uh, of Casey too before the rest of you joined us. So from Paul, Casey, this is the first time I've seen a, a no pronouns. Uh, can you help me understand how you prefer to be referenced in conversations and other communications? I'd love to learn. Uh, yeah, great question, Paul. Uh, and turns out I do this intentionally, um, right? And and so I, what I was sharing with folks was um, when I'm in space with like my people, uh, I let them know that like I use they, them, their pronouns. Uh, but a lot of times in spaces where there is some sort of like educational component or a specific DEI conversation that we're trying to have, um, I have found that people will... Um, skirt the intended conversation by spending a lot of time inquiring about either my pronouns, uh, gender identity in general. Um, and I have found that it's a form of resistance that um, really derails what the intended conversation was. So uh, I don't use them. Uh, and then I'm like, well, you could just use my name. Like that, that, that is one of the reasons I'm like, you could just use my name. Um, but, but that is the, the point of that. And, and then I also feel like it's nice for me because like I get to build relationship with folks before I um, open myself up into like a new line of questioning. But, uh, but yeah, that, that's why I do it so that we don't lose focus on the intended topic. 
All right. Um, the next question that got several upvotes was from our Holly, another returning champion of our community. Thank you for coming back, Holly. Uh, so Holly asks, uh, DEIB can be polarizing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, how can we position this conversation on allyship within the larger context of creating psychological safety? Good question. I, I feel it's hard for those with privilege to understand what it means to be an ally, but they may be better understand what it means to make sure someone feels safe. So how, how can we meet them with that? And Art, please feel free to include your thoughts on this as well. I, I love this question. I mean, I live this every day, the, the polarizing, the industries that I run in, you know, automotive manufacturing defense. Um, I, I get this all the time. And I'm always trying to find a way in to, to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I recently did a workshop on, um, there was a team that wanted to know how do we motivate ourselves and how do we motivate our teams better? And so there was not one element of DEI. We did talk about psychological safety, uh, which I think is really important, but at the end, everyone wanted to talk about inclusion. And so I think we just have to find that way in and I think psychological safety in particular can be very effective in appealing to the bottom line. Because if people don't feel safe um, challenging the status quo, we're at risk of making a huge mistake, right? There's the Google Aristotle study, there's Timothy Clark's work, um, Amy Edmondson, right, talking about it in the medical industry. And so, you know, letting people know that, you know, price of entry is um, am I valued? Am I included? You know, is it safe to make a mistake? Can I learn from my mistakes? Is it safe to contribute? I may have a seat at the, at the table. I may feel included, but if I don't really feel safe, I'm not going to contribute, right? And I'm certainly not going to challenge the status quo. So I, you know, coming from the auto, auto industry, I'll look at um, General Motors with this uh, ignition switch recall there was a lack of psychological safety and look what happened inside that company. It cost them billions of dollars and it cost human lives. But then I look at Ford Motor Company when Alan Mal Malali came to lead. Um, his big thing was when we're having these program reviews and we're looking at the red, yellow, green status, why am I seeing green, green, green? Why is everything green? And when he, you know, he asked that question, the first time someone came in with a red, he gave him a standing ovation, right? So I think it's like, we have to find that way in and there's so many ways in, but appealing to the bottom line and the risks that we could avoid with psychological safety, I think is a, is a really good way in. So yeah, yeah I, I could talk about this one for an hour. I love this question. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I would just add, uh, echoing what Cheryl said, I'm very big on psychological safety, as Sherry knows. And I think that psychological safety is the perfect umbrella or open door to continue this conversation around allyship. Um, I also think it's really important to have a conversation about around risk management, not risk management as we know it, but personal risk management. And I think allyship has to incorporate um, to some degree a sense of personal risk that we're that we're willing to put our reputation out there or put our name out there um, to advocate or ally for a person that is not in the room or a person who otherwise would not have my level of influence or my level of access. And I think that's important. And oftentimes, um, if we're unwilling to, to risk personal risk, um, then we're not true allies. We can be ally in perspective, but we're not ally in action. And I think that's huge. So psychological safety um, is a major platform for having the allyship conversation, but also I think having that conversation around personal risk and being able to have that personal risk conversation uh, in the workplace, which from what I've seen rarely happens in many organizations around DEI. Uh, that's what I would add. Who else? Alfred, Casey, Casey, Alfred, anyone add anything? I just really like what Art said yeah. a lot. Yeah, I don't know uh, if you if you are aware of Jennifer Brown. I learned a lot. I, Art introduced me to Jennifer Brown. <laughs> uh, 
uh, who uh, has just an amazing consulting uh, or uh, firm around a DEI. Uh, and I remember hearing her in one of her, I think monthly, weekly, I can't remember conversations um, saying, and, and she's, you know, she just, she's so intelligent and so passionate and you just, you just want to listen to everything she said. And I remember her reflecting uh, that, um, you know, she, she doesn't have a heterosexual partner and she was very concerned when she would go into the firm on, on Mondays, everybody would talk about their weekends and she would have to like filter and fur and dodge and, and she felt less than you know, every Monday morning when she went back into work and she said, I just, you know, I didn't feel psychologically safe. I, you know, I, I don't know how long ago this was, but, but uh, it really brought her to this work. And I, and I think, um, you know, just that simple reflection of having somebody dodge uh, or to kind of filter what they say or be afraid someone's going to find out who they really are or something that they're really hiding, you know, just is, is, incredible. And if we can't feel comfortable around the people that we are team members, we have to be, we have to dodge and be careful about, you know, what language that we use and we can't be ourselves. We can't be our best selves at work. So Sherry you just um, yeah. made me think of something. Uh, so there's a friend of mine who is a professor and um, she is gay and she said she got her new classes this year and she's out in two of them, but she's not out in three of them. And she just didn't feel that psychological safety to come out. And she was telling a friend of hers about this. And the friend is like, I'm going to go in that classroom and I'm going to tell them. And she's like, no, no, <laughs> right? you're putting me in an unsafe situation. So I think when we think about this whole idea of allyship, we have to consider that as well, right? Is our allyship going to cause someone to be in an unsafe situation? Absolutely. I like what Alfred said earlier too about you know the caring conversations. It's very individualistic and 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 like what Casey said, we're not a there's not a, a block of people, all black people, all gay people, and you know so a caring conversations. I thought was was a really nice way of talking about that. Um, can I just build off of what Cheryl had added in there about uh, one of the things? Uh, a little bit of like kind of a joke, but not really. It's a real practice that like some of my collaborators and I do is like check in early, check in often, right? Because instead of me being like, you know what, I'm going to stand up for this person. I might be like, Hey, I just want to check in with you. I notice that every time you share an idea, you don't get credit for it. And I've seen three other folks get credit for your idea. Um, that seems terrible. Um, is there a way that I can model or like step in um, to demonstrate that, like, I hear you. Uh, and, and I think that one of the, like, and then people can be like, actually, I don't need you. Uh, or they can be like, I got ways, but we can have lunch, right? Because they might be like sending the, like, the, like Ooh, maybe we can build a relationship here. We'll see, right? Uh, and then just checking in, right? Of like, you know, I have some folks where it's like, sometimes I know I have to stand in front. Sometimes I know I need to step to the side. Sometimes I need to know I need to be in the back and just be like, I heard them, right? Like, and I think that there's that piece too of like checking in with folks to be like, hey, I noticed this behavior. What feels good to you? Yeah. Turns out people have the best ideas of what works for them. <laughs> And I, and I actually think that's huge when it comes to, again, psychological safety is having that check in coming to someone and saying, hey, I saw this, you know, you know, is that OK? Are you OK? Are you needing assistance? If not, but I just want to check in. I love that check in, Casey, because that, again, builds psychological safety with people so that individuals then begin to view you as a potential ally and advocate when they need it. And I think that's huge in the workplace. I think that's absolutely huge. Um, and not and being unafraid to cross, you know, for, for me, when I first started in this DNI work, I, I, I was the loudest advocate for African Americans, which made sense because I had a personal stake in it. But when I truly understood and took on allyship, I recognized that that it was a greater opportunity for me to advocate across. That, that, that intersectionality to, to across into other people's experiences 
Um, so because it, it didn't have a, it was a personal risk then. It wasn't based on personal experience. And I think that's huge. And sometimes in workplace, we miss those opportunities. We miss those opportunities to advocate across other communities um, for individuals if, if they need it in those situations. Yeah, I love this. Love this conversation. The the check in is is wonderful because um, you find that we struggle to really mindfully listen to people uh, because we're just so distracted as as people with so many different things. Is that when we do go to check in, is like, are we really present with them, um, or to hear what's being shared, and then being able to repeat back and be like, okay, let me make sure I understood what, you're, what you shared with me. So I know how to put that into practice later, or I know what action to take. At that, that point, that makes someone know that, okay, they're actually really listening and hearing me and what I'm sharing. And you know that the, it's something that's resonating with them when they come back to you in the future and be like, hey, can I talk to you? You know, I'm, I'm having a hard time with something. Um, my mental health isn't, you know, is, is good right now. And I, I trust I can conversate with you. And so you know that you're that you're being present with people when they're following up with you at a later time. And that's a good sign. Uh, but we have to practice our listening ability to be present and try to re reduce some of the noise and distractions as hard as it can be in a in a in a world where we're filled with so much information and, and so much awareness. I also like the, you know, the earlier conversation about checking in with yourself first, like checking my intention. Am I, am I here to gossip? You know, am I going to start something or am I really, really interested in how this person is doing and wanting them to know that they're, they're safe with me? I love that. And also, Art, I really loved um, not just, not just being an ally for the, for people of color or men of color like yourself, but you're also modeling, hey, I have, I have agency you know, for other groups, intersection, uh, intersectionality or uh, any other marginalized groups and you're modeling, oh, he's not just doing this for, for black people or for black men. That's, that's really powerful. Again, it's that representation. I don't have to sit in a box. I don't have to wait for somebody to ask a, a black person question. I love that. Okay. Um, another question from Holly, where are we on time? Good. Another question from um, Holly is one thing I don't find a lot of guidance on is how to apologize when I've offended. Uh, where are your prescriptives on how to apologize and what constitutes an appropriate apology when you've erred? Ooh, we can all use that. Who wants to take this one? I'll, I'll start it. I, it. To be able to show genuine care for an individual um is important so if maybe you think that you've done something that when you reflect it and you're like oh they didn't say anything to me but i didn't feel right about how i delivered something and i may have offended someone or done something wrong that it's that time where you could say let me send them a message and either say you know through the message or say hey can i get a chance to talk with you i just want to follow up on something and how our interaction was and i just want to you know i'm 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 really trying to do my best to, I have this practice and and I want to be able to hear from you on how you felt when I did this. Um, so so I'm not guessing or assuming anything, you know, I'm hearing it straight from you. Um, or they do tell you, hey, I felt this way and, and I didn't feel good about it. Um, it's that time when we're actually open it, and, and doing the best we can to not take things personal. Um, and knowing this is, okay, how can I be present to learn from this experience and then for it to the point of mindful listening, be able to say, okay, I understand what happened and where I could have done different or, or, or what that allyship support looks like for you. Um, and really expressing the gratitude. And I think Casey had talked about it earlier, like people are taking their time and their emotions and saying, here's how I felt. I was like, wow, that's very courageous of you and very, you know, for you to be vulnerable and come to me in that way. Um, thank you. Let me express gratitude. I really do care about you and I want to see you successful and I want you to see happy and healthy. Uh, 
let me let me work with that. Let me sit with that and let me look to be better the next time around. And I would love to have an open dialogue to continue to conversate this through in the future. Um, and and you have that two ways, that open conversation lane there that you start to really build a connection. And 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 so I think it's about, you know, gratefulness for their time and expressing genuine care, but then backing that with the actual um, you know, walking the talk afterwards is is essential for that follow-up. Yeah, and I, I would just underscore the being grateful for them um, speaking up and sharing that because it obviously takes a lot of courage. The only other thing I would add is detach yourself from the outcome. Like, mm -hmm. they don't have to forgive you. Okay, see. Yeah, no, I think there's so many... There's no one way, right? I think you have to have like a, a feedback tool belt uh, that you have, right? Because sometimes when I'm really resourced, it can happen in the moment. It can be aggressive. It can be like kind of mean. And I can be like, oh, that's helpful, right? Like when I'm not resourced, I am also like, I'm like, oh, look at that defensiveness showing up easy. Okay, let's like calm that down. Uh, so part of it also has to be like understanding your own feedback loop of like, uh, how do you receive feedback? What sets you up well for that? How do you care for yourself? Because what I learned after years of messing it up uh, for myself was when I was under-resourced, I had to be like, I really want to hear what you have to say. And I really want to absorb the feedback you're about to give me. I'm not in a place where I think I will be able to absorb that fully. Would it be all right if like either we met a different day uh, you can send it to me an email, but if you've prepped and you're ready, give it to me, right? Because I do want to create that part of like, this is where I'm at, I really am interested. And also like, if to, if you're like, no, I've been thinking about this for a while, I need to get this off my chest. Okay, I'll take it. Um, so I think there's that piece um, when we're getting that kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback. The other thing is that we have to reframe how we think about feedback, right? Feedback is a gift. I'm more concerned about the feedback I don't get, right? Because when I get feedback, what that's, that tells me is that person isn't invested enough in me doing better that they provided me with this feedback, right? And I also feel like, you know, we're human beings. Sometimes we're like, it feels terrible uh, to learn that you've hurt somebody. It feels awful to know that when like what you're trying to do did not match the impact that sucks um and so there has to be a process for that too right uh, i used to keep bubble wrap at my desk that i could just be like okay <laughs> right so i could kind of let it out um that was after i quit smoking right so i was like oh, yeah. i was like um and like i think that there's this piece of like sometimes i journal uh, about it and now, because this is a professional environment, I have a mess up list. Um, it's an Excel spreadsheet, right? So I'm like, oh, when was it? What did I do? What happened? What was the feedback? What did I learn? What might I try differently next time? Mm -hmm. And like, again, I don't expect anyone to be that anal retentive or nerdy in this, but like, it's a system that works for me, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so like figuring out like also how to set yourself up for that, um, because I feel like you want to be able to receive it. You want to be able to capture it. You want to be able to reflect on it, but you also don't want that person to experience any of that labor that you're going to engage in. Right. Um, and like, you know, being a nerdy white person, I have a formula. Right? I acknowledge the harm. I apologize for the impact of it. Um, I talk about what I will do differently. Uh, I talk about how I will be held accountable. I thank them for their emotional labor. And I ask and inquire if they are interested in um, hearing about my accountability practices and my updates. Um, but, and I just wanna like really echo Cheryl's uh, statement there about like, you can't be attached to the outcome. Apologies are like a gift that you're gonna leave at somebody's door. It's not up to you if they take it or not. And that has to be okay because the apology is the point. Yeah. Woo. Woo. Wow. Wow. That was, that was wonderful. I, um, I have, 
I'm very, you know, conflict averse. I think a lot of us are. And I remember the first time that I uh, had a colleague um, say, tell all of us, you know, when I'm doing that, I can't, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm just being natural. Can you please give me feedback so I, you know, so that I won't do it again? I need, I need specific contextual and give me an example. And I remember like screwing up the courage to go into his office and I was terrified because I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but he, he offered, he, you know, said, give me feedback. So I think just Casey, just acknowledging that it's really scary for somebody, you know, to give you feedback if, you know, if they're doing it coming from a place where they, they know that you're asking, you want to, you want to do better. So I think acknowledging that this is really hard for them. It's not just about you. Beautiful. <laughs> I, oh, what's happening in Danielle's world? Some, something's going on there. I got, Hello I enjoyed, there. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, a heartfelt thank you to Alfred, Cheryl, Casey, Art, um, and even you, Sherry, you're always great at jumping in and adding your wisdom, but thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. And for those that um, are still on. We thank you so much for participating as well and, and um, being a part of this space. We do have a birthday today um, on our panel, and it is that of Casey Tonnelly. <laughs> and so I just wanted to bring in my son's birthday balloons and just tell you happy birthday. <laughs> um, and thank you for taking um, time out of your restful trip uh, vacation to be with us and to participate in such an important discussion. I, I admire the heck out of you. So I just wanted to say happy birthday. And if, for those of you on, if you could just yeah, share some love in the chat for Casey, uh, that would be great. And I hope you have a dino birthday. Uh, that's awesome. Thank your son so much for uh, letting those balloons share space with me. Uh, and thank you all. Cause I think that, you know, I don't want to miss stuff like this, right? Like to me, like this is my birthday, yay. Uh, I've also had a glorious day. And like, this is the stuff that means the most to me. Mm. Getting to have real conversation, getting to connect with other people who are committed and have their battle wounds and struggle sometimes and are still learning and growing and pushing, right? Like that push to never stop that like, this is exactly who I want to spend time and space with. So thank you all um, for coming today. Thank you, Casey. You really walk the talk. Um, you know, we've really appreciated building this global community and have found so many ways to support each other as we work to create more inclusively led organizations and communities. And um, as you continue to lead in those efforts, we wanted to share with you uh, just a couple opportunities that may add value to your learning and development. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to share a couple slides for those of you that are interested. Um, just bear with me. Wrong slide. So sorry, Sherry, maybe, maybe you can throw it up because I think I'm having some technical difficulties. I'll start talking about what these are. So we started this DNI series in September of 2020. Uh, to make good on our commitment to use our platform as a space to learn, to share, and to build community. Thank you. And, um, and celebrate belonging. So, and so many incredible practitioners and leaders have uh, shared their experiences and insights that we wanted to package um, all of our quarterly discussions um, into a guide for you. And so we were gonna be, we're gonna put that together and send that over to you before Thanksgiving sometime. Um, for those of you that didn't get a chance to participate in any of our earlier discussions this year, um, they were all amazing, um, spoiler, alert, spoiler alert, but <laughs> we'd love for you to go back. Um, also, it gives you a chance to learn more about the people that participated. Um, so we will include that in an email before um, the Thanksgiving holiday, so stay tuned for that. Um, next, we've been really enjoying this year's DNI um, certification training um, with so many incredible leaders of so many different industries and backgrounds and geographic locations. So if you're interested at all in joining us in 2023 and joining a cohort um, and earning some DNI badges, uh, please just drop your email in the chat and we'll send you more information uh, once that becomes available. Um, so yeah, again, if uh, drop your email in the chat, we'll send you more information about what we've got going on in 2023 and how you can participate in a cohort. 
Um, and lastly, if you're if you're just if you are stuck or if you would love a partner in helping you roll out DNI strategy, um, if you just want to learn online, um, and in addition to having a facilitator help guide you, uh, let us know. They uh, we have some great people, and you're looking at a few of them on screen that have um, really bring this to life for so many teams and organizations. Um, so if that is you and you want to participate in some way, shape or form, or just get more information. Um, this link here, which I will drop in the chat or Sherry will, because she's operating the slides at the moment, but we'll drop that um, link in. If you're interested, just fill out that short form and we'll, we'll get right back to you um, with more information. Um, so that is, that's what we have. And again, thank you so much, everybody for participating being here, especially our panelists. You all are amazing people. <laughs> and I've learned so much from you. And I, I wrote down so many notes and one of them was where the discomfort is, there is growth. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.